So I want to let everybody know, this is the MS Advocacy Hub. This is a virtual program online that we began at the beginning of COVID. Okay, and I am Stuart Schlossman, but you all know that already. And uh, and then we also have our guest for today. We have Lindsay Wallstrom. Hi, everyone. Thank you. And we are sponsored by Sanofi Genzyme, Bristol Myers Squibb, and Biogen. Okay, so we are going to. Oh, by the way, this is this series. Normally, you have me interviewing, or normally I have me interviewing different people that are online. That you know, we bring in as our guests, and they and we talk about these topics concerning COVID and 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 or you know what the resource is that's doing things for the MS community. But normally, again, normally I'm interviewing everybody, but today's program we're doing differently. All right, so Lindsay is going to do a presentation. Okay, and Lindsay Wallstrom is with. She's with uh, Antidote.me, all right, and she's going to be doing a presentation first. When she's done with that presentation in about 20 minutes, then I'm going to come back online, and then I'm going to interview Lindsay. So for now, though, I want to say thank you, Lindsay, for joining us, and take it away. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, we're big fans of MS Views and News, and so uh, it's an honor to be invited to be presenting as part of this conversation. Uh, as Stuart mentioned, I'm going to start with just a few slides, a, a short little presentation to give some context to clinical trials and medical research. Um, I found that that really helps to ground the discussion a bit later, but I really want to get to the, the heart of the matter, which is to answer your question. So I'm going to keep it brief, and then I invite the team to upload the slides to the website uh, or any other resource hubs that you have. Okay, so without further ado, let's get started. So I'm Lindsay Wallstrom Edwards. I'm the head of partnerships and patient advocacy at Antidote. Antidote is a digital health company and our uh, main focus is to connect people with new treatment options, particularly through clinical trials. Uh, a bit about me, I started my work actually in behavior change communication. So I worked uh, with an organization teaching people how to write soap operas and do social marketing around different health and environmental issues. I got very interested in how to measure actual impact, and so I went to graduate school and studied public health, uh, particularly epidemiology, which has been an interesting background to have in the last 12 months, shall we say. Uh, and then I found this role at Antidote while I was working in clinical trials myself, uh, thinking there has to be a better way to connect people with research, and this landed in my lap. So I've been here for about six years, and I work with our partners like MS Views and News to help raise awareness of clinical trials as an option. Uh, and with that, let's move on. So our mission, as I mentioned, is to enable faster medical innovation by transforming how sponsors and patients connect. We do this in a couple of different ways, um, but to start, nope, that's fine, to keep going. Uh, to start the conversation, I wanted to make sure that we're all on the same page and we understand what is medical research. Uh, so according to the National Cancer Institute, it's research in which people or data or samples of tissue from people are studied to understand health and disease. It can help find new and better ways to detect, diagnose, treat, and prevent disease. There are two main types of research. There's observational research and interventional research. It's a little jargony. And there is a slide in the resources. So again, I won't go through it today, but feel free to re revisit this at a later time. Uh, that explains it a bit more. But in short, interventional research is when we're testing a new treatment. It could be a drug, it could be a therapy of some sort, a device that helps uh, or is aimed to help detect, diagnose, treat, or prevent disease or disease progression. In this case, we would be talking about MS. Observational research is, um, you know, it's sort of like the gateway, <laughs> the gateway to research participation. You can donate your health data via your health medical records. You can uh, decide to answer questionnaires about your experience living with MS. Uh, to give some data to researchers who might be trying to better understand how MS uh, is, is present in the body, your experience with it. Uh, they might be looking for genes, uh, so maybe a genetic testing study, um, opportunities to think about how the disease comes about, uh, and then how to help people live more full lives while also navigating this diagnosis. Um, People often ask, why should I consider participating in research? And there are two main reasons. So first, 
the more altruistic reason is that without you, there can be no new treatments or cures. 80% of medical research is delayed or canceled due to difficulty enrolling participants. And I, I don't put that um, completely on, on the potential participants in research. I think there's a lot that we as an industry can do to better engage people in ways that are acceptable uh, through trusted sources of information. We can answer questions and, and we could design studies that are a little bit more friendly. But this is a statistic that's shared a lot. Um, and the reason that it's shared is that that's, that's significant, that 80% of research is delayed. Uh, for every day that we're delayed in getting people to participate in research, uh, we're delayed in getting new treatments out and available to the general population. And that is because every single drug and device that is available to an individual, regardless of condition, has to go through a clinical trial. That's true of Tylenol, that's true of chemotherapy drugs. Uh, so it's really important that we get people involved in research. There are other benefits to people who participate in research too. So uh, first you get to access new potential treatments before anyone else, because again, every treatment has to go through a clinical trial. You get to help the community. It's a great way to give back to the MS community overall. Um, both observational and interventional studies are a great way to do that. Uh, you're helping uh, people to learn more about the diagnosis and find treatments that can be effective. You get to access top-notch care. Generally speaking, research is run through uh, academic medical institutions. There are, are different ways to do that, but you're getting access to the people who have dedicated their lives and spend a lot of time thinking about uh, the best way to help uh, an individual with their MS diagnosis. So you get really great care, uh, a really great follow-up. Uh, you'll have consistent communication with the study team, so people are really looking after you. And in some instances, there is compensation available. Generally, this takes the shape of access to study medications or treatments for free, uh, but there might be other compensation available depending on the study and the sponsor. Um, but this is my biggest reason. It's that the first person who's cured of anything will be in a clinical trial. So if you are someone who's really motivated to contribute to science, to give back to the community, um, this could be potentially a benefit of that. The first person cured of cancer, of MS, of lupus, of type 1 diabetes will be in a clinical trial. So hopefully I've sold you a little bit on the importance of participating. Um, for the record, I also do participate in research when there are opportunities available to me. I think it's important to practice what you preach. Um, but if I've piqued your interest and you're wondering how you can find a clinical trial, we do work with MS Views and News. Um, you can come to Antidote's site, uh, which is antidote.me. And on the homepage, you'll see a button that says uh, patient, question mark, and you can enter in a condition. So MS, you could choose anything else. Actually, you could put in a, a subsystem or sorry, subsymptom of MS. You could be looking for mobility specifically, um, but you can enter that condition in. Uh, you will be asked a handful of questions. And what we're doing in the background is we're taking all of the clinical trials that are in clinicaltrials.gov, and we are asking you about those inclusion and exclusion criteria. So every study is guided by a document called the protocol. And in the protocol, there are guides about who, would, who can participate in that particular clinical trial, depending on what the researchers are aiming to do. So usually there are inclusion criteria, like you need to be aged 18 to 80. You need to have a confirmed diagnosis of MS by a physician. Uh, it might be you need to have uh, relapsing remitting MS. Uh, there, could be, uh, there could be specific criteria around medications or your symptoms. Uh, so, so those are called inclusion and exclusion criteria. You either can or cannot participate depending on how you fall into those categories. Uh, so we are asking you questions that help to sort through the studies and their inclusion and exclusion criteria. And then we give you a result, a short list of studies for which you may be eligible based on how you've answered the questions. They're completely sponsor agnostic. The results are displayed based on the fit. So again, if you definitely would not be eligible, we've removed that study uh, in the distance from you uh, and from the zip code that you've entered. On the results page, you can uh, register to receive trial alerts, which are emails that we'll send um, once a month if there's a new study in clinicaltrials.gov that matches the questions and criteria that you've provided during your search. 
You can also filter the results uh, primarily by phase. So phase one and two uh, studies are, are generally looking at safety and efficacy of a new drug or device. Phase three is where that test happens in the more general population. So you might say, you know, I'm really looking for something that's already gone through some, some level of testing. Uh, and then a phase three might be a great fit for you. Um, I do want to note that before human trials begin, there are always, uh, always rigorous uh, testing that happens in the lab setting. Uh, so we're not, we're not unknowingly or, or unwittingly injecting people or providing a drug that would be um, harmful to their health. Uh, and then you can also choose the study type. So again, that's interventional and observational, the two main ones. So I'm going to give you some homework, uh, and the homework is to go to antidote.me and search for a study that might be of interest to you. Um, chances are you're going to have a few to look at. And so on the next slide, I've given some guidelines of questions to ask yourself. Uh, and the reason that I, I say ask yourself is that this is really about what is of interest to you. Uh, it's a personal decision about your care. So Think about the kind of trial you're interested in. Is it interventional? Are you more, more leaning towards observational? What phase of trial are you interested in? What kind of time are you able to give? And in the age of COVID, what do you feel comfortable with? Uh, there has been a big change in the industry towards doing uh, virtual studies or having a hybrid design where some of the care is happening in the home setting. So maybe a phlebotomist comes to your front yard and does a blood draw. Uh, or maybe you want to go into the clinic setting and you would feel more comfortable there. So think about those types of questions. Um, think about if you would be okay if you got into a trial and you were on a treatment that was working really well to control a symptom that you find particularly troublesome. And then once the study ended, you would have to stop taking that, that drug at least until approvals came through. Um, if that would not be acceptable for you, that's an, an important question to ask the study team before you sign the informed consent document. You would need to think about if you need reimbursement for your time and travel. Um, do you, if, it, if the study site's pretty far away, would you need a hotel? Uh, would, would that be something that you would need this, the site to pay for? And then also think about the kind of information that you would wanna receive during and after the trial. Uh, I think it's important to feel like a partner in research because without you, research can't happen. Uh, and, and I say the collective you, uh, without any of us, research can't happen. And so uh, think about what you would need to feel like a true partner in this work uh, rather than a, you know, a subject uh, or just a participant. Here are some things to expect. Uh, before the study, you'll have some level of pre-screening. So you'll fill in an online screener um, or maybe have a phone call. It could be a combination of both. When we are finding people to participate in studies, we do a little bit of both. It may involve follow-up phone calls uh, with the folks who run the trials. At some point, you will be asked to grant the site access to your medical records so that they can verify information. They may have questions about that. So they might call you as you go through that. And then during the screening visit, so you'll have your, um, your online screening, your phone screen, and then you'll come into the site or maybe have a virtual telehealth type meeting, uh, and at some point you'll be asked to review and sign an informed consent document. This is a really important point. Informed consent is a process, it's not just a document, so it's an opportunity for you to read and digest the information about what are the potential benefits to participating, what are the potential risks to participating, what is expected of you, what the researchers are committed to giving you. So you read all that information, you ask your questions, you get answers that are acceptable and that you, you feel like the study site has fully responded to your questions and your concerns. And then at that point, you can decide if you want to consent to participating in the study. You can withdraw consent from any trial at any time for any reason. So if as you get the study gets underway, if it does, it's not the right fit for you or you need to, um, change a medication and you're no longer eligible, that's okay. You can withdraw your consent and withdraw from the study. Uh, but you do need to sign that informed consent before you can uh, truly screen for the study and randomize into, into the project.
Um, during, if we could go back one, uh, during the study, you will have uh, visits at a regular frequency. So either in person at the site or online. You may be asked to keep a symptoms journal or other journal. If there's a diet study, you might be asked to keep a food log or a drink log. Um, and then you'll probably have some check-ins between the site visits. And afterwards, you can ask to see the results, both your individual and the collective. Um, ask before you sign the inform informed consent document. Be sure to get clarity on what type of information will be available to you, um, if that's important to you. And then you may be able to continue taking the medication, and that's something that you can find out before you enroll in the study. There is a potential outcome that you might not have a study, uh, an interventional study that's available to you. So there are a few other options if you're really interested in participating in research. You can join a registry. A registry is generally either your medical records or it could be uh, donating a tissue sample or blood samples um, to researchers so that they can better understand uh, the, the genetic profile or um, other, we call them biomarkers, so like blood levels or, uh, or, or test results that are important. You could join a patient advisory board. A lot of pharmaceutical companies uh, or biotech companies will have a group of individuals who inform their, uh, inform their practices and who weigh in on what they're doing. So it's called the patient advisory board. Um, generally, you can find information about that on a company's website. And you can participate in something called the protocol simulation. This is increasingly common. Um, and this, what a protocol simulation is, again, you might recall I said the protocol is a document that guides the entire study from start to finish. Um, and it ex explains in detail every aspect of the study. Um, uh, what some companies will do is they will ask a group of volunteers uh, or participants to pretend as if the study is running so that they can identify aspects of the protocol that might be challenging. It could be focused on the inclusion or exclusion criteria. It could be a challenge about the logistics of the study. Uh, so it's a really great way to give back and ensure that the trials that do come available to the community are, uh, are ready and, uh, and ready to be successful and, and are set up for success. With that said, uh, there are, generally speaking, more study opportunities available than people who meet the study criteria. So uh, you should have study opportunities available to you. And if you find a project that you're really interested in, it's worth calling the researchers because sometimes those inclusion and exclusion criteria can say, um, you know, you can't have uh, Hep B unless it's controlled sufficiently through medication. So it's really up to the researcher to determine that. So you should always reach out when you're in doubt. And that's my contact info. We can stop with the slides now, but again, I'm happy to share these if they're a resource for the folks on the line. All right, great, thank you. That was extremely, extremely welcome that you did that. I'm, there's no way I could have asked any questions that gave all the information you just provided. So thank you. Yeah, of course. And by the way, everybody, I forgot to give Lindsay's full name earlier. It's Lindsay Wallstrom Edwards, okay? So let's just get that done and we'll go on to the next thing. All right, so one question that um, just came in was, if you participate in a study, are you precluded from any of the others? It depends on the study and it depends on the other studies that you're interested in. So for example, uh, if you participate in a registry, you're probably not precluded from participating in any other kind of study. If you are participating in a biologics, so a study with a biologic involved, then sometimes that will prevent you from participating in another study. There's also a common term called a washout period. So it could be that you need to take time, a certain amount of time between other studies. You generally can't do two drug trials at the same time, um, but there are people who do lots and lots of research. Uh, they participate in research all the time. Uh, they'll just you know, wait that washout period or make a decision about what they would like to do next. Okay, hey, thank you for that. All right, can you tell us a bit more about the screening process for the studies? For example, I know many people who want to participate, but they get turned down. I personally was turned down several times. Yeah. Can you explain this in more detail and what happens, please? 
Yeah, well, good for you for being turned down a few times. And I say that because a lot of people will get discouraged the first time and then they don't try to participate again. Um, the the way that protocols are designed, you think about a clinical trial, you're trying to measure a certain endpoint that is called an endpoint. Um, so the scientists are looking for a very specific profile of an individual. Uh, and so going through those inclusion and exclusion criteria, if you go to the through the antidote search, when you get to the results page, you can click in and view the full list of criteria. That's something to look at with your doctor probably is a good person, a good resource for you, um, because you might be able to determine before even going to the site that you don't meet the criteria. Unfortunately, sometimes it's a lab value and sometimes it's a lab value that fluctuates uh, that can determine your eligibility. Uh, but it's important to look at those criteria ahead of time. If you have questions, you can call the researchers. Uh, they can answer them over the phone. Um, but it is really about adhering. It's about the science. And, and when I mentioned at the top, I don't think we always get the balance between the science and the human right. Uh, so I'm really excited about things like protocol simulations because you can find out what, what are going to be those trickier criteria. Um, but sometimes you don't, you, sometimes you do something, it's called the screen fail. So sometimes you fail the screening process. Um, but it's, you know, hopefully there's another study that's out there and available. And sometimes the researchers are running lots of different trials. So you can ask them uh, if they know of anything else available to you. Okay, thank you. So a lot of times patients wait for their doctor to recommend that they get involved with a clinical trial or patients might feel that, well, they'll hear about this, but that they have to contact their doctor first. What can you say about that, Blues? A lot of doctors are not involved in running clinical trials, and so they might not even know what's available. Um, and it's not it's not one of the items that you have to cover uh, during a visit, right? It's not on it's not on the guidelines that you something you need to cover. So we always encourage people to be proactive if you're interested in participating in research to initiate that conversation with your provider. We've done some research with with surveys and asking people about their experience, and we find that. Most of the conversations around medical research are initiated by the individual who's receiving the care from the provider. Um, so that's a good way to do it. If you're really interested in research, you might consider selecting a provider who's involved in research because they would probably be more likely to recommend a study or to be thinking in that way. Um, but it is a good conversation for you to take the lead on and bring up with your provider. Okay, thank you. What if a person doesn't feel comfortable participating in the clinical trial but they still want to help. Is there anything that they can do to support clinical trials without direct participation? Absolutely. Um, there are registries. So I, I can think of two off the top of my head, uh, registry type options for individuals who are living with MS. Um, and in that, in that instance, you would donate your de-identified health information to a, to a group uh, so that so that researchers can go in and say, here are a thousand people who are living with MS Let's look at their characteristics that they have that are the same. Um, maybe there's a group that will you know, do an at-home genetic test. Uh, so you can have a kit mailed to you, you do a genetic test, you send it back, and you're contributing to research in that way, but you're not participating in an active investigational clinical trial. Okay, thank you. Can you tell us please why, um, can you tell us please the importance of why people need to get, be involved with clinical trials? Yes. Uh, so you mentioned before that truly without uh, people who are willing to volunteer and raise their hands for research, uh, we can't have new treatments. Uh, they, they have to go through a clinical trial. So if we think back to COVID um, and how quickly researchers were able to move based on the science they had been investigating and, and working in for about 10 years, uh, it was the volume of people who raised their hand and said, I want to be in a vaccine trial or I'm sick and I'm and I'm worried I'm gonna get really sick. I want an, a monoclonal antibody trial um, and I'm willing to do that. And so it, the, I think the, what the last year has taught us is that people being willing to raise their hand and say, I wanna to contribute to research and I wanna be part of the solution is how we get new treatments out there faster. And it's the same regardless of condition. Okay, thank you. So Tammy just asked, are there any trials for patients with more than one disease? There are. Uh, that's a great question because I it, de it depends a little bit on the study again, the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, there are there's a term in 
cancer research right now called the basket trial, where it's looking more at a genetic marker than at the specific type of cancer. So you'll see like a study for 30 different kinds of cancer. Um, we're seeing that shift in general toward that type of thinking across all conditions. So it becomes more about what's happening at the genetic and cellular level, um, rather than how that condition is expressing itself in the individual. Um, so I don't, I don't know uh, off the top of my head which conditions you, you could have and still be eligible for all of the studies are more than 500 in clinicaltrials.gov or MS. Um, but I think we will likely see in the, in the next few years a shift toward that idea of the BASCA trial across lots of different types of conditions. Right. So you do recommend, though, that everybody go onto the site and if they have more than one thing wrong with them, that they can register for everything. Yeah, so what, uh, first you can register for lots of different conditions. The other thing is when, when we go through the, those inclusion and exclusion criteria, we'll ask questions about other conditions that you might have. And so we will take out the, the conditions or the studies that you would not be eligible for based on that profile. Um, so often you'll see like you can't have, um, for autoimmune disorders, you can't have multiple autoimmune disorders, um, but you could have heart disease and an autoimmune disorder. Um, you know, and so we can ask those questions and then let you know which ones you might be eligible for based on how you answered those questions. And we can save that profile then and send you alerts for studies that you might, might qualify for. Okay, thank you for that. Now, how many clinical trials are there like per year or happening now for multiple sclerosis? Um, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. Uh, uh, there are, generally speaking, hundreds of studies that are available in the United sure. States alone uh, where, you, where you're where you searching through and finding options. Uh, in general, at a global level, there are about 60,000 studies running at any given point in time with about 14,000 of them active in the United States. So uh, there are a lot of clinical trial opportunities out there for people who are looking. Great. Thank you. What is a biologic? A biologic. Um, I'm not. So I'm, I'm a scientist technically, but I'm not like a scientist scientist. Uh, <laughs> so Is that why you wear glasses? I wear glasses. Yeah, it's like I try to look smart. Um, so, <laughs> so a biologic is a specific type of drug. Um, sometimes we see, uh, you know, I'm. I'm going to punt this one, actually. I'm going to I'm going to punt it because I don't want to misrepresent it. So can I get back to the to the team with that? I don't want to misrepresent it because I don't I'm not as familiar in the MS space and I, I don't want to give misinformation. Got it. Thank you. So somebody asked me, uh, what is dot me after your uh, why is it antidote dot me? I said, I have no idea. I'll have to ask. Oh, um, do you want the long story or the short story? Oh, <laughs> uh, because. Well, first of all, it's an it's an antidote for the condition. So give me an antidote. Um, it also works that way. Uh, and there may also have been someone who is holding the dot com hostage. Uh, so there you go. <laughs> gotcha. OK, well, those were two pretty short versions. All right. Um, can you share with our audience again how they can access the portal, the portal to the clinical trials through your through antidote dot me? Yes, absolutely. You just go to the homepage. So HTTPS colon slash slash antidote dot me. And then you enter in a condition under patient question mark um, and you can take it from there. OK, great. Thank you. So I don't have anything else for you. I think you answered everything. I think between the video and what you spoke about, we will be able to you know, show this off to many people. Oh, somebody just asked a question. How about that? There's yeah. a particular clinical. This is from Cindy. There okay. is particular clinical trial that I would like to get in, but I missed the cutoff age by two years. Oh, that's something else I'm going to ask you. All right. Is there any case where your MS doctor can advocate for you to try to get you accepted? Um, it depends. Uh, it's worth reaching out to the researchers and seeing what they can do. Uh, sometimes those are set in stone for medical reasons. Sometimes they're more arbitrary um, and it's just the range that people are looking at uh, so it's worth reaching out uh, particularly there's something called a protocol amendment which is someone can go in and uh, sometimes the the 
study team will actually change the protocol and that has to go through rigorous approvals process if that happens. Um, but if there's a huge screen failure rate on age, they might consider a protocol amendment. So it's always worth reaching out uh, and asking if you know if you might be considered for that. Okay, great, thank you. So that led to something else, and that is that are most clinical trials with age limits? Often we'll see 18 plus. Uh, there are some pediatric MS studies that are available, uh, so you can go ahead and. Um, you, if you're if you're caring for someone for someone who's under the age of 18 who's living with MS, there might be options available too. Um, sometimes there will be an age limit of generally it's it's pretty high, you know, in the 80s or 90s, um, but really? mostly 18 plus. They're looking for the adult age age range. Okay, so in other words, so because a lot of people have concern that well, when they get to 65, they're not allowed to do these things anymore. So you're saying though that they go into the 80s as well? I often will see studies that are like 18 to 85, 18 to 90, or just 18 plus is what we're looking at. It depends. Great, yeah. thank you. Thank you for that. And Cindy wrote me to say thank you to you, okay? So I'm saying thank you. You're okay. welcome. Great. All right, so that's then it. We don't have any other questions. I wanna thank you again for being with us today. We will, I will look forward to getting this published, getting it onto our YouTube channel. We'll let you know about it. We'll send it out to our entire community as well, and they'll know about it as, and they'll know about it too. All right, so um, thank you again for joining us, and we look forward to working with you in the future. That sounds great, and I will follow up with the biologics. I just wanna make sure that I get the right information out there always. So I'll send that to you before I publish anything. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Have a great thank day. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye-bye.